So the next type of epithelium is glandular epithelium. So let's go ahead and talk about the two types of glands, all right? And so these glands are specialized for secretion. So they actually produce something. They produce products. So the two types of glands are the endocrine gland and the exocrine gland, all right? And these endocrine glands are sometimes referred to as being ductless glands, meaning they do not have a duct. Now, the products that they secrete are referred to as hormones, all right? So that's important to keep in mind. So the products are referred to as hormones. So in other words, these endocrine glands will secrete hormones. Now, these hormones will enter blood will enter the bloodstream. And at that point, they're going to circulate throughout our body. So what I've done is I've drawn an endocrine gland, which can be seen right over here, okay? So I highlighted the yellow area, which represents the glandular epithelium, because after all, this is the type of epithelial tissue or epithelium that secretes products. So they're not lining or covering epithelium, they're glandular epithelium. And once again, they secrete hormones. So these hormones are going to end up in blood, all right? So this is why I have an arrow pointing into the blood vessel, because we know that circulating in the blood vessel is blood. So at this point, these hormones are going to circulate from head to toe. So examples of endocrine glands are your thyroid glands and your pituitary glands. So next semester, you all are going to learn all about these endocrine glands and the secretions and the hormones that they produce. All right. The next type of gland are the exocrine gland, all right? So exocrine glands are sometimes referred to as duct glands. Why? Because they have a duct. So the purpose of this duct is it provides a conduit, right? It's a way to make sure that the secretions are channeled to end up in onto some type of surface, right? Like the surface of our skin, the surface of a lumen, into some type of canal or passageway. So by having a duct, it's a means to channel or to, to, to say, okay, this is where the secretions are going to, to end up in. All right, it's like a duct, basically, and that's why it's, it's part of this exocrine gland. Remember, the endocrine glands do not have these ducts because they know that it's going to end up in a blood vessel. All right, so if you recall, we talked about the exocrine gland briefly in the beginning when we mentioned uh, epithelial tissue or the two types of epithelial or two types of epithelium. So here is my illustration, or an image, I should say, of an exocrine gland. So the non-secretory part is the duct, all right? So the non-secretory part is the duct. So this is why exocrine glands are sometimes referred to as duct glands, because they have a duct. And uh, the next part of the exocrine gland is the secretory part. So this is the part of the exocrine gland that does the production of the secretion. In other words, it's what produces the products. All right. Now, the products. The one thing you need to remember, these products will not end up in blood. OK, this is why it needs a duct to channel where these secretions are going to end up in. So please remember, the products produced by these endocrine glands do not end up in blood because otherwise we would be calling them hormones, which they are not. Okay, so please remember the, the secretions produced by exocrine glands, specifically the secretory part of the exocrine gland, will not end up in blood. They're going to end up on some type of surface, like the surface of our skin or uh, the into the lumen, for example. All right, so what are some of these secretions they produce? Well, sweat, digestive enzymes, oil, which is officially called sebum, earwax, which is referred to as cerumen, milk, mucus, tears. They're all exocrine gland secretions. So there's nothing here that says hormones, all right? Because if there were hormones, they would be produced by the endocrine glands. 
So the next thing we need to tackle is how they secrete their products. So we're now going to look at the mode of secretion, all right? How do they secrete their products? Now, with the glands we're looking at, as far as the mode of secretion, will be the exocrine gland. So we're considering how these exocrine glands secrete their products. And of course, they are not hormones. All right, so the first type of secretion is referred to as merocrine. So most of your exocrine glands will secrete in a merocrine way. This is your classic exocytosis that you learned in 189, right? So basically the cells will just essentially uh, exocytose the secretory vesicles, which contain these products, sweat, digestive enzymes, oil, earwax, milk, right? So they secrete classic exocytosis these cells remain fully intact. And the reason why I'm emphasizing that is because you're gonna see the two other types of modes of secretion where the cell does not remain completely intact. So as far as the cell is concerned, they remain completely intact. So examples of merocrine secretion are your sweat glands, your salivary glands, and your exocrine glands of the pancreas. Now, as far as what I want you to know, Right, as far as an example of a merocrine secretion, are the sweat glands. Okay, so please know that your sweat glands secrete their products in a merocrine way. So basically, when sweat is being produced by the sweat glands, it does it by a merocrine secretion way, right, or mode. So let's now look at the other types of uh, modes of secretion. But before we do, I thought I'd show you essentially why your endocrine glands are ductless and why your exocrine glands are duct, meaning they have a duct. So just looking at this image over here, it just shows us essentially the development of the exocrine and the endocrine. So I hope you see that it boils down to being epithelium, right? So the covering lining epithelium and the glandular epithelium, it's all epithelium. So take note of the development of the exocrine gland and the development of the endocrine gland, all right? So you could clearly see that the exocrine gland has a duct. That's why they're sometimes referred to as being duct glands, while the endocrine gland has no duct. It disappears. But check out the blood vessel. All right, so I want to really point this out, the blood vessel. So if you look at how the endocrine gland is associated with the blood vessel, it's literally right there, okay? Why? Because as I just said, the endocrine glands will secrete hormones. So when the hormones are being produced by these endocrine glands are being secreted, guess what? They end up going into that blood vessel. And of course, the products being hormones. Okay? Hormones. If you look at the exocrine gland, we don't really have a blood vessel that's associated with this exocrine gland because the products that these exocrine glands will end up in will end up in into some type of surface. And of course, we have this conduit called the duct that channels the secretion so it ends up ending up on some type of surface or into a lumen, for example. All right. So the other two modes of secretion are apocrine and holocrine. So let's first look at apocrine. So what happens with the apocrine is the top part of this glandular epithelium will literally break down, will break away, will break into many pieces, as you can see with these images. So if you look carefully over here, you can see how the top half all right, the apical part, so to speak, literally disintegrates. It breaks away, it breaks down. And you can also see it over here. Bottom line, the cell does not completely remain intact as what we saw with merocrine, right? Remember with merocrine, the cell remains intact because it's your typical exocytosis. This is a different story when it comes to the apocrine mode of secretion. So you can see how the top half of the cell basically pinches away and breaks into many pieces. And by doing so, that's how it releases the products. 
Now, an example of americrine mode of secretion are the mammary glands. So when a woman is lactating, meaning she's nursing an infant, this is how her mammary glands will produce the milk, all right? The, the top part of the mammary glands, the, the secretory part of the mammary, gland, mammary glands will literally disintegrate and there goes the milk, okay? So we know that the um, plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer and of course phospholipid is a type of lipid. So that contributes to the fattiness of breast milk. The next type of mode of secretion is the holocrine mode of secretion. So what happens here, ladies and gentlemen, the entire cell will break away, all right? So the cell does not remain intact whatsoever. So the whole cell literally breaks into pieces. And by doing so, the products are released. Once again, this is exocrine. Okay, so we can see the disintegration of the cell over here, right? So as it's disintegrating and breaking away, the, the contents or the products that it produces is now released. So an example of a holocrine mode of secretion are the sebaceous glands. So sebaceous glands are commonly known as oil glands, all right? So the oil, the sebum, uh, the secretions of the sebaceous gland will end up onto our skin, for example. All right, so as I said, the phospholipid bilayer is made up of lipid, phospholipid, and again, since the entire cell breaks away, this is why sebum or oil has an oily consistency. It's because, again, of the phospholipid bilayer that helps contribute to the oiliness of the sebaceous gland or the products, sebum. So let's now talk about the gland structure. So we have unicellular glands and multicellular glands. The only unicellular gland are the goblet cells, right? The goblet cells. And it is the only unicellular gland that we have in the human body. Now, if we look at the word unicellular, that means one cell. So in other words, the goblet cell is a standalone glandular epithelial cell, right? It's one cell. That's why it's called unicellular, one cell gland. It's the only one that we have, the, these goblet cells. So what do they secrete? They secrete mucus, all right? They secrete mucus. So sometimes they're referred to as mucus producing cells. And they do so by classic exocytosis. And the reason why they're called goblet cells is because they take on this goblet uh, shape -ness to it, sort of like a wine glass, like a goblet wine glass, right? So if you look over here, you could see it right there. These are your goblet cells. And the reason why they appear clear, because the secretion is mucus. And mucus has that clear, uh, opaque type of color to it. And they're usually scattered among the other epithelial tissue, the lining epithelial tissue, all right? So remember, these goblet cells are unicellular, standalone, extracrine gland cell. They're just one cell, they're not clustered together, and they discharge mucus. All right, so multicellular glands are how the rest of the extracrine glands are designed. So other than goblet cell, all the other exocrine glands fall into this category or this gland structure. In other words, they're multicellular. All right, so that's going to be dependent upon the structure of the duct. It's going to depend upon the shape of the secretory portion of the gland and the relationship between the duct and the glandular areas. So what's pictured below here are all multicellular. So just the picture alone should tell you, at least the two pictures that are here on the bottom, should show you basically this is not one cell, right? It's not a standalone cell. It's clustered to give us your typical exocrine gland that we talked about, the duct and the secretory part. So to make this easier to understand and to sort of organize it, what I've done is I've created a diagram. All right, so this should not be anything new. You know, you all probably already realize that I like to 
sort of draw this out or in some type of diagram because I think it makes it easier to comprehend. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is looking at the duct. Remember, these are exocrine glands, right? Sometimes referred to as duct glands. So they have a duct, these multicellular glands. All right, so the duct is the non-secretory part. So this is the part of the exocrine gland that is non-secretory. So you have to ask yourselves, is the duct, the non-secretory part, is it divided? Does it divide? If the answer is no, then we refer to them as being simple. So this illustration that I made is a simple duct because it doesn't divide. Now, what if it does divide? Then we refer to it as being a compound duct. So I hope you understand my illustration and I hope you see that the compound duct is divided. So we have a simple duct that does not divide or a compound duct that does. So that, once again, is the non-secretory part. All right. Well, what about the secretory part? The part that does the secretion, right? That produces these products. So we're looking at the secretory part. So let's first consider the shape. What is the shape of the secretory part? All right. So we're considering the shape, ladies and gentlemen. If the shape takes on a roundish shape to it, sort of like a grape, then we refer to it as alveolar or acinar, right, a.k.a. So we have two different names for the same thing. So if the shape of the secretory part looks like a grape, then it's referred to as being alveolar or acinar. Well, what if it takes on a tube-like shape? I hope it makes sense that we're going to call that tubular. So once again, this is the secretory part as far as the shape. All right. Now, the next thing you need to ask yourselves is, does the secretory part branch? Okay, does it branch? So, if the answer is no, then obviously it's unbranched. So, the illustration that I, I have here is an unbranched secretory. All right, then, if it's branched, once again, I hope you understand my illustration, and that drawing is meant to show that the secretory part is branched. So the idea is to combine these together and then come up with the names given to this multicellular glands, right? Remember, these are exocrine glands. All right, now one thing also I want to point out before we go back to the slide that we just looked at is the following. All compound ducts, okay, all compound ducts, ducts that, that divide, are all branched. Okay, so if the duct is compound, it's a given that the secretory part will be branched. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to see if you can draw this on your own. If you have to pause the video, by all means do so and then we'll compare answers. So if I say simple ASINAR, okay, simple ASINAR, how is that going to, what are you going to illustrate? How will you il illustrate a simple ASINAR exocrine gland? So if you'd like to pause the video and then show me what you came up with, that'll be great. All right, so let me draw the simple ASINAR. All right, so the first thing you're going to draw is a duct that does not divide. So what I'm drawing right now is simple ASINAR. So this purple two. Uh, parallel purple lines represents a simple duct, which does not divide. That's why it's called simple. Then let's draw ASINAR. And there you go. Okay? Simple ASINAR. All right, how about this one? Let's draw simple branched tubular. Simple branched tubular. So the first thing I want to draw is the duct. Simple branched tubular. So these two purple parallel lines represents the simple duct. Simple branched tubular. So first thing you want to do, or I should say the next thing you want to do, is draw the secretory part as a tube-shaped structure and show it as branched. So if you came up with something like this, then you are correct. Okay, so this is simple branched tubular. Now, note, 
If it's unbranched, we can skip the word unbranched. So this is why when I asked you to draw simple asinar, I didn't say simple unbranched asinar. So the point I'm trying to make is the only time you insert the word branch is if it's branched. If it's unbranched, you drop the term, like what we did with simple asinar. So let's now go back to the previous slide and apply what we just went over, right? So we're going to go back to the previous slide and apply what we just learned. All right, so we have two images here that shows us the multicellular glands. And if you look at simple tubular, which is down over here, notice that it's unbranched and we did not have to say simple unbranched tubular, okay? Now over here where it says simple coiled tubular, so we throw in the word, word coiled because of the fact that the tubule or the tubular shaped secretory part is coiled, all right? And here's another example, the simple branched tubular, all right? So you could see how the ducts are simple and we have more images on this image, all right? So the top half that I just encircled with this green highlighter shows us essentially your simple ducts. Compare that to the image below. So check out the ducts, all right? So they're all branched, or I should say they're all divided. So we use the word compound. So I hope you can understand why one is simple and one, why the other are compounds. It all has to do whether or not the duct divides. If it doesn't, simple. If it does, compound. All right, then we have the secretory part, right? So if it's round shape, alveolar or acinar, if it's shaped like a tube, then it's tubular. All right, so if you look at the compound ducts, remember what I said, all compound ducts will have branched secretory part. Okay, so all compound ducts will have branched secretory part. So if you carefully look at the compound ducts, all their secretory parts will be branched. Okay, so carefully look at each of the compound ducts. Okay, compound tubular, compound acinar, compound tubular acinar. Now, the reason why it's called tubular acinar is because it has a combination of both tube shape and round shape secretory part. Don't let that throw you off. It's just, it's a combination of both. What I want you to pay attention is basically if the duct divides and as well as the secretory part, does it branch, okay? Now look at the compound ducts. They, and of course the branch secretory part, the fact that the, all the compound ducts have branched secretory parts, we don't need to include the word branched because it's a given, right? So all compound ducts will have branched secretory part. This is why we don't say compound branched tubular. We drop the branch because it's already understood it's a compound duct, therefore it has to have branched tubular. So we don't need to put the word branch. Compound acinar and compound tubular acinar. Now, as far as the exocrine glands, uh, uh, what I'd like you to know is whether, whether it's simple coiled or simple branch acinar are the ones that I've highlighted in yellow, All right? So if you look carefully, I'll, I'll go ahead and encircle simple coiled tubular. So I would like you to know that the merocrine sweat glands are simple coiled tubular. I'll explain what these glands are later on when we get to the integumentary system. I'd also like you to know that sebaceous glands are classified as being simple branched alveolar. I'd also like you to know that the mammary glands are compound alveolar, aka compound acinar. And finally, I'd also like you to know that the salivary glands, which is highlighted in yellow, is classified as being compound tubular alveolar, also called compound tubular acinar gland.